Well, we met at Krista Senior Living. Working night shift. Mm -hmm. I was a brand new RN and, and just started working. And I was a nurse's aide. And so I, she was my boss. And so I knew the hierarchy of the relationship going into the relationship. It made it much, so much simpler. And so March 11th, we went out for our first date. Um, we went to a Chinese restaurant and I spilled my tea all over the table. Yep. Not yes. just a little bit, but all over the The table. whole thing. Crazy. But a, a year later, we went out March 11th, the following year, um, 1986, 86, uh, to Snoqualmie Falls. And that's where I asked her to marry me. And Snoqualmie Falls, there's a sorbet uh, course between the main and the salads. Palette cleanser. Palette cleanser. And so she went to the restroom and I had the, I had the diamond ring and I gave it to the, the waitress and I, I would ask her to bring it back during the main course and so then she comes back, the sorbet is put in front of us and she's speechless and they're standing there with a bottle of champagne ready to pour over the ice to sorbet which is what they do. She's not saying anything so I said well do you want to do you want to have some champagne? And lady Pete asked me to marry you. Yeah because I didn't see the ring there. I didn't see the ring so then when they poured the champagne over it then I saw the ring and I asked and you said. I said yes. Yep, 37 years later, still still going. How, how, how is that possible? I still laugh at your jokes. Uh, let's hear it for Bill and Pam today, huh? Come on. They're great. So Bill and Pam, they're our Kendall pastors. So if you ever want to go to church up in Kendall, that's who you get. They're awesome. Uh, we're talking about the mechanics of marriage today. I'm Pastor Kurt, and I'm glad to welcome you to this first day of our new series. It's going to be a wonderful relationship series. And again, if you're worried that it's just about marriage, it's not. I'm telling you, 35 years of counseling, I'm telling you that all of this stuff can be applied to single life, to married life, to parental life, or even to life as a teenager. You can apply this to your life in your relationships as well. But we are calling this the mechanics of marriage. Um, you know, Pastor Steve and I, we planned this months ago. We planned this series, and he was going to preach the opening day, which is today, and he was so excited to preach this message, all excited. It's Song of Solomon, right? So he was all excited about this. And then he and Darcy went on their anniversary weekend away in Whistler last weekend, and they were mountain biking, and Darcy had an accident and broke her leg on their anniversary which included an ambulance ride down the mountain and then spending the night in pain in Whistler and then coming home on Monday. And then Steve got a hold of me and said, you know, I need to be here for my wife on Sunday. You're going to have to preach it. And so um, he did the right thing. And so he's actually our first sermon illustration this morning. He chose his wife over preaching, which is always a good idea. So let's hear it for Steve. Good choice. All the women are like, yay. All the men are like, I would have gone to work. What are you talking about? But that's the first um, line in your message today. That's the first fill in the blank in your message. Number one point of your message is that love invites and asks for more. And it's an interesting place to start a relationship series uh, on the inviting side of things because normally we think about relationships, we think about pursual, and we'll get to that, and we think about you know, loving somebody well, and we'll get to that. But truly, I think relationship begins with inviting. It begins with inviting somebody into your life, and then asking for more. So let's talk about that for a minute. Love is inviting. Love is saying, I want you. I need you. Your involvement in my life is important. In Darcy's case, she's like, yeah, I can't walk. So maybe you could be, stay at home this weekend and help me take care of the boys. Love is vulnerable. Love says, please meet my needs. Please take care of me. Please respond to me. And I think even as I say that this morning, you know, we live in this world where oftentimes we experience rejection. Um, in business relationships or in relationships in general. And it can feel very, very risky to be vulnerable, to open our hearts and to, and to present the fact that maybe you need somebody in your life or maybe you need some help in your life, or you need some love in your life. Um, and it can feel really, really good to have that person in your life that you trust with your heart, right? Having that person or those people in your life who want you around, who want to be with you, who want to know you, and who accept you as you are. And so that's what that invitation invites. It invites that person or those people into a relationship with you. So when you love somebody, it's not only the giving of care and of affection, but it's also the receiving that's important. Lots of people can just live with walls up or with guards around their heart, 
and they say, you know what, I'm never going to trust anybody with my heart. Maybe you've been hurt, or maybe you've gone through some things, and you say, I'm not going to trust again. But I'm telling you, the first step to meaningful relationship is having a heart that says, okay, I'm going to trust that you're going to be there for me. And it's not just for injuries. It's not just for helping you move. It's not just for the, you know, the basic things of life. But it is also for intimacy or for relationship. So that's where we're going to start today, this idea that you can invite relationship, friendship, marriage into your life. And we're going to start in the book of the Bible called Song of Songs. Anybody heard of this book? Song of Songs. It can get a little steamy. It's like a PG-13 in places. But I promise I'll be, I'll be easy on you today, okay? Not too many things to explain to your kids when you get home. Um, but yes, Song of Songs. So let's open our Bibles to Song of Songs, chapter 1. And verse 2 carries this whole idea of invitation, that love invites and asks for more. Here it is. Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 2. Kiss me, and kiss me again. For your love is sweeter than wine. Somebody say, amen. 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 So invitation. Invitation is the starting point for love. If you want to be loved, then you have to invite people to love you. You have to invite affection. You need to be warm and inviting and vulnerable and available. Particularly if you're married and you want your spouse to pursue you, you need to be all those things. And the rejection factor has to be low. If, if you want your spouse to pursue you, either a man or woman, then you have to not make rejection as a normal part of your relationship, right? Rejection level has to be low. But here in this second verse, this woman says, come here and kiss me. That's the invitation. And then kiss me again, right? What man could turn that down? And this love, she says, is sweeter than wine. It's intoxicating. So intoxicating that this man will come back again and again and again. And I know, I know, I know. I know this song. It's between two lovers, right? It is. But may I just say that love between friends, minus the kissing. Love, (laughs) maybe. Love between friends should also carry this sense of there's something good in this relationship that's worth coming back for. You know what I mean? There's a reason why friendships grow and become... Um, a normal part of your life, why, why friends stay in your life for a long time. And it carries with it this idea of invitation, that you invite them to be present and to be a part of your life. So point number one, mechanic number one in your notes today, love says, I need you. Love says, please see me. Please notice me. Please accept me. Please value me. And not in a needy way, but just in a, a very honest way that says, I have something worthwhile to give. So please, please notice that. I invite you into that. Now, funny story, I, wrote, I write these devotionals every morning, right? So I cover all these verses that we're going to cover on the weekend. And so the first Monday of last week, I was covering this very verse. And so I wrote my devotional, went to work, and I came back that night, and my wife's sitting on the couch, and I walk by her, and she goes, come kiss me. I'm like, you've been reading my devotional, haven't you? And she goes, yeah, I admit it. Um, but it was a good kiss, I got to tell you. It was a good kiss. And why did I kiss her? Because I was invited into a kiss, right? And so I kissed my wife. So that's what love does, the mechanics of love. Again, this can be friendship. This can be marriage. This can be relationship with your children. Love invites. Love says, come see me, come know me, come accept me as I am. So that's number one mechanic. Number two mechanic is this, the mechanics of love. Love pursues and holds on tight. Just like love invites, on the other hand, you know, that's passive, but on the other hand, love is active. Love pursues the people that you really want to love. And so in this book of Song of Songs, we're going to move to chapter 3. And in this story, it's really written as a song in the Bible. It's a song that was sung. Um, And in this song, the girl has a dream. And really, it's a nightmare. It's what it is. And in this nightmare, she dreams that she had lost her lover, that that he had turned up missing, and she couldn't find him. And in her dream, she's frantic. So she's she's yearning for him, longing for him, missing him, and he and he doesn't come home. And so in her dream, she goes out and she she searches for him. And this is how she searches for him in chapter three, verse one. She says, One night, as I lay on my bed, I yearned, or that's a word that means I longed for, I missed, right? We don't use yearn anymore. I yearned for my lover, 
I yearned for him, but he did not come. So I said to myself, I will get up. I'll roam the city, searching in all its streets and squares. You, can, you get the drift of this nightmare now, right? Now she's out in the streets looking for her lover. She says, I will search for the one I love. So I searched everywhere, but did not find him. And the watchmen stopped me as they made the rounds. And I asked, have you seen the one that I love? Then scarcely had I left them when I found my love. I caught and held him tightly. In another version, it says, I would not let him go. I can't tell you how many times this has been the theme verse for weddings that I've performed. And it's usually the bride that, that wants this verse, right? I caught him. I found the one I love, and I will not let him go. And that is the, um, the, the way of pursuit in our relationships. Every relationship needs pursuit. And pursuit is the action of love. And if you look at what God did for us, it really involves this idea of pursuit, right? Who loves better than God? And so we get our model of love from him. God so loved the world that he gave, right? He became one of us, came in the flesh. He pursued us with his own self. Another verse says that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, to pursue the lost. That's us. And I love the story of the good shepherd, right? The one who left the 99 and he went to find the one. How many of you have felt like the one? I have. I've felt like the one that God, you know, left everybody else just to find me. And I I so appreciate it. So makes me feel loved to know that. And so as we talk about this this morning, as we talk about, you know, the mechanics of love, the mechanics of relationship, it's really God who gives us the standard, gives us the gold standard, if you will, of how we love one another, of how we build relationship. And it's God who activates his love for us through pursuit of us. Think about the prodigal son, that story of his father, right? Really just waiting for his son and to come home and then pursuing him with his love when he gets there. And here's what I want to say to you. It, you know, if, you, if you care what Jesus thinks, here's what I want to say. That you are the most like Christ when you pursue the people in your life with love. When you pursue them actively with your love. People feel most loved when they're pursued. Because pursuit simply says, I care. That's what pursuit says. And let me talk a little bit about what pursuit is, because maybe you're wondering, what does that mean? Do I chase them down in my car? What's the deal with pursuit? (laughs) Here's what pursuit is. Simply, it means, I've been thinking about you. I've been thinking about you. You've been on my mind, and so I. I've been thinking about you, and so I. I texted you. I sent you a note. I bought you a coffee. I stopped in to see you in your office. You know, I I went out of my way to say hi to you. That's what pursuit looks like. It can be very, very, very simple. It doesn't have to be extravagant. But it is really felt. It's interpreted as love. And so what I want to say, as you think about your relationships, whether you're a parent or whether you're a friend or or even in in a, a career situation with your coworkers or with the people that work for you, every healthy, meaningful relationship has pursuit in it. We need to be pursued. And this results in loyalty in your relationship. This results in heartfelt friendship in your relationship. When you feel pursued by a friend, I know you know this, when you get that phone call and you needed that phone call, when you get that text and you needed that text, it feels really, really good to know that your friend or your spouse was thinking about you so much that they took the time to reach out and contact you. Now, conversely, what I want to say is that if there's only one person pursuing in the relationship, it's going to feel one-sided. So it is important for, mo- for both people in the relationship to give yourselves to pursuit. So what does love do? Love pursues and it holds on tight. How do you hold on tight? Once you have caught that person or once you're friends with that person or once you have that person as your spouse, how do you hold on tight? And I think that's simply with giving them your attention. I think giving them your attention, thinking about them, you know, spending time with them, uh, putting the phones away for a while, you know, disconnecting from Netflix for a while, doing things together, enjoying one another's company, giving one another your undivided attention, I think is the best way to hold on tight and never let them go. So maybe you want to practice that a little bit. So that's number two, right? Pursuit. Pursuit is the action of love. 
Well, the third mechanic I want to bring you today is the mechanic of admiration. And I'm going to tell you that I think this is one of the most important things that you can practice in your relationships to bring healthy, long life relationships. Number three, love expresses admiration. Now, we don't often hear that word anymore, admiration. What does that even mean? You tend to think about, you admire somebody, you're looking up to somebody that's way more important than you, right? You admire their position or you admire that person. But it doesn't have to be that way. It should be every day in all of our relationships. A couple of weeks ago, I wore this one shirt to work one day, and somebody said to me, hey, I like that shirt, just out of nowhere. Hey, I like that shirt. The color brings out your eyes. They said, that's a good color on you. I'm like, oh, I like that, you know, I like that compliment. And I left that little conversation just feeling a little spunkier than I had. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, you get a compliment, you just feel a little bit spunky and, and, you know, you don't hear that every day. And so I just went away feeling like, oh, somebody, somebody noticed what I wore. Now, to be honest with you, I don't think about what people think. I don't care what people think regarding what I wear. But oddly enough, do you know what came from that exchange? Now, in the, I go through my closet in the morning, pick out a shirt, and whoop, 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 oh, there's the one. So for two weeks, I've worn this shirt every day, and I wore it today as a sermon illustration for you. I can't tell you how many compliments I got after the first service of people who said, wow, I like that shirt, you know? It's like somebody told them or something. It seems like a silly little thing. But what I'm telling you is this, that admiration is something that we respond to favorably. And in fact, I'm going to tell you that when you share admiration with your spouse, you tell them what you like about them or your friend, you tell them what you enjoy about them, that those very things that you mention, just like me wearing the shirt every day, which wasn't true, but those things that you mention to them are the very things that they're going to pay attention to. And so if you want somebody to become better, in a certain area of their life, you let them know what you enjoy about them, and they will probably pay more attention to that, and they'll become better at that trait, that character trait, that ability, the way they wear their hair, the things that they dress, what they wear, you know, their clothing, their, their personality, the things that you like about them that make them beautiful. They're going to offer even more of whatever trait that is because you have shared your admiration with them. It actually is true. It happens. And words of affirmation bring the best out of people. So telling people that you love what you enjoy about them, what you like about them, what you appreciate about them, the more they believe it, the more they're going to become it. And so if you want your spouse to get better, if you want your friend to get better, if you want your kid to get better, if you want your parent to get better, kids, you tell them what you like about them, what you love about them. And not just once in a while, you tell them often. Here's what admiration does. It builds trust in your relationship. It builds connection between the people and between you and the people that you love. Now, here's a great example. I mean, it's, it's overboard in Song of Solomon, right? Song of Songs. It's so overboard. Here's the King Solomon, and he's going to tell uh, his woman what he thinks about her. So here's chapter four. Hang on. You ready for this? A little steamy. One through five. Here's Solomon. You are beautiful, my darling. Beautiful beyond words. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Can I hear a little cooing out there? (laughs) Your hair falls in waves like a flock of goats winding down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are as white as sheep, recently shorn and freshly washed. Your smile is flawless, each tooth matched with its own twin. So, man, just a a little, a new strategy for you. Just start comparing your wife to animals, and she'll love it. She'll love it. Your lips are like scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is inviting. Your cheeks are like rosy pomegranates behind your veil. Your neck is as beautiful as the Tower of David, hopefully not as big. (laughs) Jeweled with the shields of a thousand heroes. Your breasts are like two fawns, twin fawns, of a gazelle grazing among the lilies. Now, there's a child's rendition of a picture of this goat woman, and here it is. So 
So let's just leave it up there a minute. And I want you to notice these attributes that Solomon liked about his woman. And I want you to especially notice the fawns. I will never be able to watch Bambi again in the same way as I did before reading Song of Songs. Now, I want to mention to you because, and and I'm not doing this on all of these mechanics, but this one mechanic, I feel like I need to mention this, okay? There is an opposite to admiration. There's an opposite mechanic that's not a good mechanic, and and what it will do is it will tear a person down, and it, it will cause them to become really the opposite of what you want them to become, and this mechanic is called criticism. Criticism will tear apart any admiration Uh, and the good traits that you love about the person that you love. And you cannot spend a lot of your time in criticism. Uh, There's a very famous study out by John Gottman. Have you heard about the University of Washington study? It's been going on for like 35, 40 years. And it's, it's a clinic. It's called the Marriage Clinic. There's a huge book I have on my shelf that describes the outcome of this clinic. And Gottman reports on years and years and years of research where they would take couples and they'd put them in these little apartments, and they'd have cameras mounted, and so they'd be on video, and they'd be in there for a week or a couple of weeks, and they would make observations about these couples. Now, it's beyond me how couples can be normal when they know they're on camera, right? But apparently they forget about the cameras after a while. Now, here's what they've noticed, and this is what his work is written on. They notice that uh, depending on how much criticism there is in how this couple relates... And this criticism can be physical, it can be body language, rolling of the eyes, or, you know, like this, or it can be tone of voice, or it can also be the words that they say, actually critical words. They noticed over the years that there's a direct correlation between the percentage of criticism in their communication and whether or not they're going to make it long-term as a couple. And this criticism became what Gottman referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Criticism is the first horseman of the apocalypse. And so basically what Gottman is saying with his research is if you want to ruin a friendship or ruin a relationship or ruin a marriage, just criticize uh, the, the person that you love. Just be highly critical, and eventually the wedge will be driven between you, and you'll move through into the other three horsemen, and eventually the relationship, friendship, marriage will dissolve. And so it's so important to be honest with ourselves about how we communicate to our spouse and to the people that we love. And what I would recommend to you is that you use as much admiration as possible. And offset any, you know, little criticisms you may have, may have along the way with tons and tons of admiration. And it's, it's like a bank account. If you invest, if you deposit tons of admiration into your bank account, then, you know, the one criticism once in a while when you have to share something that you don't like, Uh, that's going to be fine. Why? Because your bank account is filled with admiration. And so what we're saying is that admiration is one of the most powerful mechanics that you can possibly use and use loads and loads and loads of it in not only your marriage, but also in your friendships. It works in whatever relationship that you have. Okay. So that's number three mechanic I want to share with you today. Number four is that love shows affection. I want you to notice it doesn't just think about affection. It doesn't just hold affection for somebody in their heart, but love actually shows affection. Affection really is showing somebody that you care for them in little ways, often, throughout the day, throughout the week, just showing somebody that you care for them in ways that matter to them, okay? These can't be ways that just matter to you, that you think are important. They've got to be ways that matter to them. This week, uh, my friend Dean King texted me and he said, hey, we got some crab. You want some crab? I'm like, Dean, you're speaking my language, right? And so Dean showed his affection. He cares for me. He knows I love crab. And they go out and get crab. And so he brought brought, brought by some crab. They were expressing their care and affection for me. I can tell you, if they didn't care for me, they wouldn't share with me their crab. Because if you're a crab person, you know, right? You know what you know. And so they shared their crab with me. And so I got home after work Wednesday night. Got the crab out and cracked it all. Now, in most relationships, friendships, whatever, everybody cracks their own crab, right? You know this is true. We all have to crack our own crab. It's just life. (laughs) Crack your own crab, right? 
in my marriage, I have learned that I have to crack my wife's crab because her hands hurt. She has a condition, and her hands hurt, and she literally cannot crack crab. And so I've learned along the way that she loves it. In fact, she feels loved when I crack her crab for her. She loves it. And so I do that for her. It's one way I can show her affection. And this has really spoken to her over the years. Here's a little secret I didn't tell first service. You know what I do with my crab? I melt about a quarter pound of butter. And I put it in a frying pan with the crab. And then I make crab salad and put that nice buttery crab all over the salad. Oh, it's so good. I have cut years off my life by doing this. It's awesome. It's awesome. Going to make it to heaven a lot sooner than the rest of y'all because of all the butter I eat. Now, sometimes my wife has like a 12-hour day. She works at Christian Healthcare Center. She's a nurse. And she'll be 12 hours on her feet. And at the end of the day, sometimes we'll be sitting on the couch. And we each have a recliner on each end and the space in the middle. You know what I'm talking about? Those couches. And we'll be watching a show just to kind of relax. And she'll slyly slide her legs and feet over the couch (laughs) until her feet are obviously in my lap. (laughs) And I'm like, what do you want me to do with these? (laughs) Well... I know what she wants me to do with these. After 39 years, I know this is an invitation for me to massage her feet. And so usually, unless I'm being a real jerk, usually (laughs) usually I will massage her feet. Interestingly, um, she has said to me, when you massage my feet, honey, it's better than sex. It's better than sex. (laughs) Now, I'm not sure how to take that. (laughs) And so I choose just to believe I'm really good at foot massage. (laughs) right? But she loves it. And that's, that's one thing I can do for her that shows me my affection for her because who wants to touch sweaty feet, right? But that is really, honestly, that's one thing. And I'll have to be honest with you, there's sometimes I don't want to. I don't want to. Get those feet off me, you know? I'm a bit of a germaphobe. So stinky feet, dirty feet. Wait, I didn't say stinky. I meant dirty. For me to respond in that moment is affection. Just giving you some little ways that that this can be made real in our lives. Affection is whatever your person interprets as caring. Again, remember, it's not what you think is caring. It's not what you think is loving. It's not what you think you would be loved by if you did it for them. No, it's what they interpret as loving. So here's what I want to ask you. In your relationships... With your spouse or your kids, do you communicate affection? Do you show affection? Here are some of the simple ways uh, you can show affection. Do you hug them? Do you hug them longer than a second? Researchers say 20 seconds to get the full effect of a hug. Okay. Do you hug them? Do you hold them? Do you smile at them? Do you use words to tell them they are valued and loved? Sometimes words are the most powerful way to show affection to somebody. Now, words cut through the lies that we believe about ourselves, right? So use words. Uh, do you give them a gift sometimes? And a gift can be a text. It can be a note. It can be ve- something very simple. It doesn't have to be extravagant. What a gift says is, I was thinking about you. That's what a gift says. Um, do you look at them warmly instead of like, <sighs> you know, sarcasm, I've told you, is the 10th gift of the Spirit in our household, <laughs> But sarcasm can do some damage. So do you look at them warmly instead of sarcastically? Do you touch them, just a hand on the hand or a hand on the arm or a hand on the shoulder? Do you spend time with them? Time is affection. Do you serve them? Do you help them with things that they would normally do? Just reach out and help them. These and hundreds of other ways are messages of affection that communicate love and care. So what does affection do? Here's what I believe affection does. I think affection wins the heart of your person. If it's your friend, if it's your child, if it's your spouse, it doesn't matter. Affection, all these different ways that we just simply are telling them we care about them in their language, affection wins their heart. And affection builds this incredible loyalty into your relationship. And this is what, you know, we talk about love languages, and we're going to talk about those actually in one of these weeks. When we talk about love languages, this is what it's all about. It's about learning to express love in your person's language. Now, think about this. This is so important, you guys. 
If you catch this, you'll be way ahead in the game of helping your spouse feel loved, is what is their language? And oftentimes what I have found about people in my counseling over the years is that in most marriages, they favor different love languages. So like I might like physical touch, but my wife likes acts of service. And so I'm trying to give her all this physical touch. And she's like, no, 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 no. Just unload the dishwasher. That's how I would feel most loved, right? That would be good for me. Just help me in the kitchen. You know what I'm saying? And so oftentimes we try to give our spouse our love language, and they don't interpret it as loving at all. And then we can't figure out what is wrong with them. How do they not feel loved? You know? And it's because it's not their language. And so you have to figure out what the language of your spouse, what the love language is, and give them that. I'm telling you, this works with children, too. We, we read Love Languages for Children. There's a book out, Love Languages for Children. We read that early on in our life and learned uh, how our kids felt loved. That was amazing, instead of the way that we thought they should feel loved, right? So quickly, and we're going to cover this in a few weeks. Here they are. Affirmation is expressed through, uh, affection is expressed through words of affirmation. Good words, right? Um, giving gifts, uh, physical touch, acts of service, and quality time. Some kids just need your time. Some kids just want you to buy them stuff, right? Uh, which one would you prefer? <laughs> Yeah, me too. I have more time than money. All right, so this is how you win someone's heart. This is how you capture their heart is by giving them affection and giving them admiration. So wrapping up our message today into our fifth one, our last one, Song of Songs 4.9. You have captured my heart, my treasure, my bride. You hold it hostage with one glance of your eyes with a single jewel of your necklace. And I want to end with something that's a little different. Maybe you don't think about this too much. But number five is love chooses to be captured. Love chooses to be captured. You know, um, you can love me all day long in the way that I feel loved. But if I don't want my heart to be captured, I can choose for it not to be captured. And how does that happen? Well, I think it happens a lot of different ways where our heart, we build defenses around our heart. And either we become very self-sufficient in our life so we won't ever let anybody help us. Anybody like that? Where you're just, you can handle it. You can do it on your own. I, I don't need your help. And it's not even that you're mad about it. It's just that you don't want anyone to help you because you've learned to be self-sufficient. I run into this in second marriages. When people are getting married for the second time and they've been maybe eight or ten years single, guess what? They don't want help. They are self-sufficient. They've learned how to do it themselves. And I've, I've said to them, I've looked them in the eyes, and I've said to them, you know, if, if you go through it this way in your marriage, second marriage, uh, you're going to be robbing your spouse of the joy of helping you, of loving you that way, of serving you, of giving you what you need. Let them in. Let them become a part of your life in all these practical areas that you've learned to do on your own. So love chooses to be captured. Love allows another person entry into your heart. And sometimes this is caused by just the way you're raised as a child. I know that I was raised in a, a circumstance where I learned uh, a not to trust with my emotions. I learned to keep my emotions to myself because when I shared those emotions in my family, I got in trouble. I got in trouble. If I ever hinted that I was a little bit frustrated or angry, I would get in trouble for that. And so I learned just to keep my emotions to myself. Well, guess what the first 10 years of our marriage was like? My wife trying to figure out, how do you penetrate this guy's heart? And me just being this, you know, defensive, strong person that didn't need my heart penetrated. But guess what? She needed my heart to be penetrated. And so if you have a heart that is hard to capture, I would say to you, just remember that the people you love, the ones that are in your inner trusted circle, those people, whether they're friends or a, friends or a spouse or a child, those people need for you to let them capture your heart. This is so important. I know we don't think about this, but this involves being vulnerable. This involves um, trusting. Sometimes this involves forgiveness if you've been hurt or betrayed by your spouse. 
Sometimes you have to go down the road of forgiveness and building trust again. That can take a while. But at the end of the day, what God wants us to do, I believe, is have a heart that is open and trusting to the people that you love. And that is how strong relationships are formed. You can only go as far in relationship as you will allow your heart to be trusted by the people that you love. You know, Jesus was such a great model of all of this. Jesus captivated our hearts through what he did on the cross. But Jesus also allowed his heart to be captured by us. You know, he loves us. We're his bride. And so if you read between the lines of Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, you find the redemptive story of Christ in this story that that Christ is like the king that has this great passion over his bride, the church. It's beautiful correlation, a beautiful symmetry of thought. And so I just want to encourage you today that as we come to the communion table today, come with the idea and the understanding that Jesus modeled all five of these things for us. Even inviting us, the very number one, you you don't think of God as being someone who would invite you to be in relationship with him, but he does, and he has. And then, of course, he pursued us, right? But, But he invited us because he wants relationship with us. He loves us so much, and this is how he did it. We celebrate it with communion today that he gave himself. He, he, he placed himself on the cross so that we could be in relationship with him. In other words, he loved us in the way that we needed to be loved. Not necessarily was it fun for him. Does that make sense? He did something that only he could do for us.